All righty. Today, I need to set a couple of you guys straight. There's a, some of you, you know who you are, who don't really seem to understand what goes into this career. And I just want to squash those misconceptions right now before you get too deep in and then realize you may have made a mistake. Alrighty, hey guys, welcome back to the channel, and sorry for that somewhat foreboding introduction, but uh, there are some things that I do seriously need to talk to you guys about. I don't know, it, it, I mean, it doesn't matter, technically, I, I personally don't care. All I know is that on camera, when I do this, like, my head is just in a black void, it's just eyes and mouth in a black void, whatever, who cares? Anyway, I need to set some of you guys straight. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of people that have come to me through email, through Twitter, through YouTube, who have asked me some, some, some questions about getting into voiceover or getting more work in voiceover. And they, they all seem to basically have the same kinds of questions, same idea of voiceover, and the same false beliefs that this is an easy thing to do, and it would just be really, really easy if they just had the answers to questions. Now, it does help to get the answers to your questions. Obviously, more information, more power, more control. However, there are some things that no matter how well you know something or how much you know on a topic, you can still not succeed in the way that you're expecting to succeed. And there's a couple of these that if you're going into voiceover and you think some of these are true, then you're going to be horribly disappointed and it's going to basically destroy your enjoyment in doing voiceover. Because then you're, you're going to go into voiceover thinking that you're doing something wrong if you have these misconceptions, that it's just you failing at it. When it's, it's not, it's the industry, it's voiceover itself. But we'll, we'll, we'll tackle these one at a time and hopefully, hopefully help you out. And if at the end of this video, you still want to go through knowing that it's not going to be as easy as you originally thought. Perfect. Good. That's the, that's the mindset that you need to have. Now, first one is going to be the idea that as you go on, it gets easier. That the more credibility you get, the more exposure, the larger your resume, the easier it's going to be to get more work. Part of that is true, but part of that and a larger chunk of that is way not true. It's easier for you to get work of a certain variety, but there's always another tier. There's always another rung to the ladder that you're trying to reach. And there's always the same amount of pressure to get to the next one. Even if you feel like you're gaining momentum, that next step is always exponentially harder. So you could get all the way up to, you know, just under doing things like Pixar and stuff like that, and you've done all of the work beforehand it's still gonna feel as difficult getting up to the point that you're accepted by large studios and you know, getting past those big gatekeepers as it was just starting out. It's going to feel just as agonizing. I promise you, it does not get easier. Now, some people do get an advantage. There are some advantages that you can get. There are some ways of 
getting in front of people that can build mo build faster momentum, but you still have to work really, really hard at it. It's not like you get the perfect demo and then it's all the way to the top. No, no, no. That will never happen. And no matter how many small roles you do does not mean that you will just be awarded larger roles. Not even close. It's always going to be grueling and agonizing getting to that next level that you're pushing for every single time. So do not go into this expecting that you'll just wake up one day having posted all of your material online, having updated everything, and then there's just a contract for that big role just waiting for you. That's not going to happen. Um, the next misconception is that at some point you will not have to do auditions anymore. Wow. Someone said that to me. And, and I, uh, I thought, uh, I was like, I, I have no idea where you got that. And then I heard someone else say that, and I think it was on Twitter. And I just, I was so confused. I just lost my mind. I was like, who's telling people this? Where are they getting this idea? Where are they getting this, like, it's like that you only use 10% of your brain thing. It's bullshit. It's 100% bullshit. The more auditions you do, the more auditions you're going to do. Period. There are very few circumstances, there are very few cases, and there are very few examples of you not having to do auditions. Now, the only really example that I can think of of people having careers, solid, stable careers in voiceover and not having to do auditions are people who, like Mc, like. Seth MacFarlane, who created Family Guy and basically now does 90% of the voices. He, you know, was auditioning for a good chunk, trying to make his way into the industry, constantly getting railroaded, constantly getting blocked by gatekeepers and, and bigger studios and, you know, other voice actors, and eventually got his big break, presented a pilot for a show that was a huge success, and then has just been has kept going and technically you know as long as these shows exist and as long as all the other shows that he produces and does voices for because he's the director writer and producer um he can basically not audition anymore now as soon as these shows are over he has to go back and hustle again you know he he has to get back out there but that is, those are rare circumstances where a voice actor technically doesn't have to audition in order to get work. They've created the work that they get to do. That is very rare, not going to happen to 99.999999% of us. So put that out of your mind. Don't think that you're ever going to have that kind of show. If you do, great, awesome, good for you. I, I hope you earned it and I hope you know what's coming. But... Don't expect that to be the case. Do not expect that to be the case. Expect to do auditioning till you die. Forever. Every single week, every single day, you should be looking for auditions and you should be doing auditions. Expect that to be your life until you just are done and retired. Expect that to be the case. The next common misconception is kind of related to the first one in a way is the idea that you're always moving up, that your career is a graph always moving up. It's a straight line that is always at an angle, R rising, always climbing. That's not true. Though the bulk of your career, the overall average of how much you make per gig and how much you make per year could be climbing, could be increasing. But that doesn't mean that you're, there's certain kinds of gigs, certain level or s certain budget gigs that you won't do or can't do. If you ever get to a point when you can not do them, good, good for you. But expect to be taking on most of those that you're technically not worth anymore long into your development, long into your 
early career. So the best example for the climb would be more like climbing an actual mountain, which when you climb a mountain, you're not just always going straight up nonstop. There are cliffs, there are peaks and valleys, and sometimes you have to go sideways in order to find a better way to go up. Sometimes you just got to stay at level until you can find a new way of climbing higher. And sometimes you're going to be climbing over a, over a big boulder or a big rock and it's going to dip down. There are going to be like peaks and valleys that you got to go down. So every now and then you're going to be going down in, in your career a little bit before you can actually elevate and climb higher. Don't think that these are going to be huge uh, obstacles that, that you've failed in any way, that this is whole, that you're, you're, you're letting your dreams down. That's not what that means. It's not what any of this means. It just means that there is such a variety of work. There are so many different kinds of clients and there are so many different ways of connecting with those clients that the variety that you're going to get some and a good chunk of them are probably going to be less than you're actually worth. And that's just going to happen. And you're probably going to have some months when that's all the work that you're actually going to get. It's ones that you're technically above and don't let that get you down. Just, you know, you can turn them down or you can accept them, what have you, but it's going to be a period when the work that's going to come to you is not going to be what you're actually worth. And you're just gonna have to choose. Do you not make any money? Do you let those go by? Do you negotiate for more? Do you do those jobs for what they're offering? Now, most of the time, if a client comes to me and they want me to work for something that's far less than what my listed rates are, I often say no if the client is not willing to negotiate or give me more information. There are tons of gigs that I am totally fine doing, you know, for, for less than my rates, as long as there is full transparency between me and the client. There was one that I actually had to cancel very recently where it was clear that it was commercial, that it was a commercial for a product with the sole purpose of generating profit for the the content creator. I think it was like a it was a phone app or something like that. And it was definitely intended for a profit. And they wouldn't give me all the information. Fortunately, I was able to actually go to the website because in the the dialogue in the line that they actually sent me actually had the website. And so I went there, looked at uh, look at all of it, read the information, was able to piece together that this was clearly for a profit and they didn't want to pay commercial rates. And so those are the kind of things that I will cancel. Now, if someone comes to me, a small client, and they're like, hey, I'm doing an app game or I'm doing a Facebook game and it's a small, small game that, you know, this is my first and it's not that big and I'm can't really pay the commercial or whatever. Uh, if they come to me and openly tell me all the information and then tell me regretfully that they can't pay the commercial rate, if I like the product, if I like the client, if I like the, the script, if I like the context of it, I'll probably still do it. If, you know, I'm not swamped for work or if it's not wildly under my rates. If it's like, yeah, can you do it for $10? It's 10,000 words. No. <laughs> and Godspeed in finding who will do that. But if it's like they just can't pay the commercial rates or it's half the, the word count rate that, that I'll do, a lot of times I'll be a little bit more generous. So there are peaks and valleys. You just got to get used to that. It's going to happen. Now, here's one I get so much to the point that it infuriates me because a lot, a lot of the time this is on a video. This is on a video on YouTube when I'll be talking about voiceover or I'll be talking about microphone reviews and stuff like that. And people could literally just scroll through the comments and see someone else has already asked this question 
and see how I've answered it, because it's normally pretty much the same, but they'll still ask it, and it is, what microphone should I get? I don't care. And you shouldn't either. Yes, there are some lemons. There are some true career-destroying garbage microphones. However, and I've said this many times, and I've responded to these comments in the same way, I don't know you and your voice and your situation. I don't know what kind of recording space you have to record in. I don't know what it is you're trying to record. There are so many different ways of giving the right response that the best response is to go with the one that you can afford. Now, some people think the one they can't afford is the cheapest microphone. There seems to be two trains of thought here. One is to go with a $15 cheap Chinese knockoff microphone that doesn't even do 48 volt phantom power and is essentially just a, 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 di a large diaphragm looking microphone. And then it's just, it just sounds like a headset mic that's further away. And then on the other side is people who will spend $4,000 on a microphone because they think the microphone makes their career. Both are wrong. Both are wildly wrong. You have to find something that you can afford, but is still a slight burden on you. Not to the point that you break the bank, not to the point that you can't pay bills, but maybe you have to compromise when it comes to, oh, I won't be able to go you know, hang out with friends or I won't be able to go to the movies or I won't be able to go get fast food or order out or what have you or buy games. I'll have to spend this money buying a 60, 50, $100 microphone, what have you. That's more what you should do. As far as what brand you get, if it's if it's past $50, if it's past, past $50, and it's an XLR microphone. It does 48 volt. You're probably fine. It's not going to sound amazing, but you don't need amazing at this point. The, your tier, your clientele, the bracket that you'll be in isn't looking for amazing. They're looking for doable, reasonable, acceptable. And if you're doing a project like a fan dub or a comic book dub or something like that, or someone's just looking for voiceover for their, for their really small YouTube channel, a lot of times they don't really care too much about the quality. A lot of that level clientele isn't too worried. But you don't want to screw yourself over by getting the cheapest microphone. So as far as like what brand, what number, what name, I don't care. If you're going to get a USB mic, it needs to be more than $90. Because not only are you having to, you know, because with the with the XLR mic, you got to get a decent interface, which there are some that are like, I mean, I've, I've, I've reviewed a couple that are like $30, 30 to $60 interface, name brand, totally fine. Don't even, doesn't even matter which one, you know, microphone more than $50, doesn't even matter which, which brand is going to be probably fine. As long as the XLR 48 volt phantom power, large diaphragm. Um, but if you get a USB mic, you're combining the XLR and the interface together. So think of the two parts that are in there and what each individual part is worth. How much should you spend on interface? More than 30. How much should you spend on microphone? More than 50. Put those together, 80 to $100 USB, name brand, totally fine. So a lot of people worry too much about the brand name, the style, there are so many factors. There's so many factors. And when you're first starting out, you're having to learn a lot of information. You have to cram a lot in your head. You got to learn a lot. You got to become an audio engineer. You got to become your own agent. So go with simple and work your way out. You just need a decent 
microphone. You just need a, a decent place to record. And then as you go on, you will develop these things and you will get better. You just need a place to start. Don't break the bank and don't buy the cheapest garbage. There's a very comfortable, very wide range between those two. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter too much. And the last thing that I will say, the last one that constantly comes up, the last one that a lot of people mention, a lot of people ask, and a lot of people are concerned about, is going to be your demos. Now, your demos are important. They're very important. But not for everything. Your demos are just a way of showcasing the quality and performance. Outside of those things, your demo doesn't have to be amazing at the beginning. And you definitely should not pay to have someone produce your demo at the beginning. For the most part, just doing your own demo that has no sound effects, no music, and is just performance that just showcases the clean audio is going to be fine. I think Bill Deweese actually said something like that not that long ago. It's going to be totally fine. Um, as you go on, you're going to want something that's more produced. But again, your first tier of clientele is going to be people that aren't going to be worried too much about you having a professionally produced demo. They really just want to hear the quality of your recording space and the quality of your audio and if it's reasonable. And then whether or not you have any acting skill. You're not going to be auditioning for big projects for a long for a while anyway, so you don't need a demo that reflects that kind of work. So when you first start out, your demo is it's important to showcase your audio quality, but it's not that important to have a mass produced demo because here's why you still have to do the auditioning. You still have to negotiate with the clients. The demo, when you first start out, is good and is important, but could be somewhat meaningless for the kinds of clients that you're already going to be aud auditioning for and the kind of projects that you'll be shooting for and trying to find. Because again, within that tier, most of the stuff that you'll be going for, nobody knows who anyone is anyway in that bracket, in that first beginner amateur, um, I don't know, enthusiast tier, the people just starting into voiceover. Just below that is someone who hasn't even picked up a microphone. In this first bracket is people who no one knows who they are. They've just started, probably only been doing it for a year, don't really have a a demo or they've only just just got a record self-recorded demo don't really have any paid work to their name in that bracket in that tier where you're first starting out the clients that you'll be finding are people that are independent on youtube independent fan dub makers independent very small video games and most of the time when you're auditioning it doesn't matter that you have a huge resume it doesn't matter that you have all these other things, a lot of those clients are just looking for people that will just fill the voiceover void that they have in their small projects. The next few tiers, your demo is going to become more and more relevant, your resume is going to become more and more important, and communication and reoccurring clients has become more and more valuable. In, your, in that first tier, it really doesn't matter. You just got to get out there on these free platforms and you just have to audition, all this kind of stuff. Because you need to be auditioning and you need to get used to the, to that. You, you personally are going to benefit more from that first year than anyone else that you're going to be working from. Because you, even if you're not getting paid, you need the experience and you need to know what it is you need to do and how to do it well. And you're still in that learning phase. So, I mean, you're going to be throwing out your first demo very early on, you know, that first year, after that first year, you should basically just discard that completely. When you first set up your studio, you first set up your recording space, and that first demo that you make, after a year, you will already have learned so much from doing auditions and from communicating with other people and listening to other people's demos 
and from the cl- from the clients and the work that you hopefully do get, that that first demo was total garbage. You can throw it out, and then you'll be making another one, hopefully. And then again, it's not going to be all that necessary for a long time until you start getting reoccurring clients, paid work, and a resume. Your demo is really not that important. You know, it it can come and go very quickly, very easily. So don't stress too much over it. And I know a lot of these questions and a lot of these concerns come from one train of thought, and that is the idea that if you start wrong, that you'll ruin your opportunity, ruin your chances. That's also not true. You can make thousands of mistakes in the first day and it's not going to matter it's not going to matter because in a year's time if you let's say you did send in a garbage audition that was so bad it was offensive (laughs) to a major studio and somehow you found the audition you went you send it and it was total garbage a year comes around they don't remember you They don't remember what you did. They don't remember any of that. The only way that anyone will ever remember your mistakes is if you actually have credit to your name, if people know who you are. So for a good chunk of your career, most of your mistakes are really not going to be that that big a deal. It's not going to be anything worth sweating over. So if you make a garbage demo at the beginning, who cares? Next year comes around, you make a demo, pretty much no one heard it anyway. No one heard the first one. No one was listening. You you weren't able to get in in front of the people who mattered, so it's fine. Who cares? Your new demo is way better. Great. Awesome. It's like the last one didn't exist. And that's basically how you should consider all your demos is like, what? I didn't have a demo from 2019. What are you doing? What? (laughs) That's stupid. And then as you go on, you'll be fixing these mistakes, including the audio quality. Again, You didn't do that many auditions because you couldn't find that many auditions. So even though your, your, your audio, your recording space, your microphone, your interface has now vastly improved, it's not like you ruined or burned any bridges that you could have made during a year. Who cares? It doesn't matter. No one remembers. We have the brains of fishes sometimes. Fishes? Fish? Whatever. Sometimes. And... Our memory is really, really short, especially when, think of it from the people, the producer and director's perspective. When they're auditioning people, they get a lot of auditions. They're not going to remember the names of everyone. They're only going to remember the names of the people that they, that get the role. And that's only for the period of them working together. After they're done, uh, unless it's an ongoing relationship of like a longer, long form project, they forget their names. They're not going to remember the mistakes that you made. They're not going to remember that you were in an empty living room or an empty bedroom and the reverberation was insane and the microphone wasn't perfect and there was plosives and your demo wasn't all that good. They're not going to remember that. It's fine. As you go on, you'll get better. You're not going to ruin your career or all your opportunities in the future by making huge mistakes in the first couple years. It's fine. It's fine. You're stressing too much over this. Believe me. And it's just going to get harder. (laughs) And you just got to keep working at it. You just got to keep doing the auditions. And you'll get better. You'll get better. And that's it. Those are the main things that I have had to kind of talk to people about and kind of put their mind at ease uh, in the past couple weeks. It's just come up a lot. Just don't worry about it. You're worrying about it too much. It's going to take a while. Everyone takes a while. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone's first demo is garbage. Everyone. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So anyway... 
that's gonna be it. Thank you guys for watching. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Totally fine. Subscribe if you're new, bell for notifications, and leave down in the comments section below. I'd like to see me cover any other topic. Have any questions? Totally fine. If you leave a thumbs down, however, you have to say why, otherwise it doesn't count. I know who you are. I know who you are. And that's it. So until next time, peace.